you know, people often ask me, David, I say the same thing you did. Well, I get probably the most common question was, wow, you've been CEO for 25 years. You know, how did you get there? How did you, how did it happen? I said, you know, I, I never sought it out. I just, I, I grew up poor. I was hungry and I worked harder than everybody. I over delivered on what people asked me to do. And I was really respectful of people. Hey, everybody. David Nagel here. I have a very special guest, Joel Manby, um, who is the publisher and the writer of Love Works, um, an amazing book um, on, uh, on how to apply love uh, to leadership and life. And we're, today we're going to talk about what's actually going on with the COVID virus and the principles that he's taught um, as being a CEO in, in some major companies, including, including SeaWorld, by the way, which is pretty cool. I wish we should need to do a podcast on that for yeah, a while. That, we could another time because that's, that's- I know, than- right? <laughs> that, like I would have all kinds of questions on that one. Um, but, but we're going to talk about your principles and how you're applying them or helping people apply them to what's actually going on with the crisis that we're involved in now. So tell me about these principles. Yeah, let, let's just uh, start with the overall purpose and premise of the book, and then I'll go sure. into those. Um, I really wrote the book because of my 25 years plus of being CEO of four different companies. I learned the hard way, I think, the good, the bad, the ugly of leadership. And I learned through my experience at, at Hershen Entertainment, which was just before SeaWorld, this is another theme park company, I learned an exact opposite approach to leadership than when I was in the auto industry. And that was to treat people with love, but it's love the verb. It's agape love. It's, it's not emotion. It's a verb. And I learned that through the Hershens who own that. And we happen to be featured on Undercover Boss. And because of that, we got so many letters to other people who felt like I did, that there must be a better way to lead. There must be a way you can care about people and still have a successful, profitable business. And the Hershens showed me that. So I wrote the book called Love Works, and it really takes seven principles of agape love, which is a verb, and it shows how to implement those in leadership. And it's proven, David, uh, in the two companies I ran and also many others like Chick-fil-A or Popeye's Chicken, it's proven to get very, very good results, increased engagement from employees, lower turnover, better profitability, better guest scores. And that's, the, that's what the book's about. So anybody who's listening and, and really wants to understand that kind of servant leadership, it's called Love Works and available, um, obviously, where, wherever books are sold. But I th- for today, because we're in this crisis, I'd love to walk through those seven words one at a time and just let's have a dialogue because I, yeah. I picked a principle from my own career that uh, I hope will help your listeners in this time. So yeah, sure will. I'll, I'll start with patient. This comes from Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians, love is patient, love is kind, but he used agape as the Greek word in that, in that sentence. So with patience, I think in this crisis, David, and you've seen it, people are incredibly stressed. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety. And I think even grief right now, people are grieving uh, what's happening. We, we know something has fundamentally changed. Yeah. We just don't know how much it's changed, right? I mean, when 9-11 happened, we knew that things were going to change and it's travel's never been the same since. Something like that's going to come out of this. We're just not sure. And so I think it's really important for, for leaders to not only be patient with employees and, or their family members, whatever you lead to show respect, for that as a leader, not get impatient. This is the time for compassion. Uh, we have to still get results, but, but it's very important to be patient and also patient with ourselves because I don't know about you, but I'm a very kind of type A personality. I get so hard on myself. Right now, I don't think it's the time for leaders to beat up on themselves or certainly on their, on their employees because we we have to be calm and we have, we also have to be rested and a, a tired, exhausted leader is not a great leader. So yeah. those are just a couple of principles uh, within patience that I, I'd love to just throw out there and get your thoughts on. 
Well, you know, you brought up 9-11. Another interesting fact about the comparison between this situation and 9-11 was that in a relatively short time, we knew when life was going to get back to normal after right. 9-11. Even though we knew it was going to change, we knew when we were going to be able to start traveling again and kind of get, you know, move on with life. With right. this, every day it's unknown. You know, it keeps looking like it's further and further in the future. We really don't know when it's going to be over. And I think that um, it makes people feel out of control. Yeah. Um, and if they're out of control, in my opinion, and in my experience, they don't have a feeling of inner certainty, right? So like the, with love and with patience, in, my, in the way that you're describing it, to me, it gives them something to focus on and something to practice that gives them control over something in their life. They're, they're actually doing something by practicing patience. So that's kind of how I see it. That is, that is such a great comment because it leads to, I think, the ultimate point in this patience, uh, the one of the seven words, is we, we just have to be present in the moment. And if we try to project out what may or may not happen, uh, it'll absolutely drive us all crazy. We can't control, as you know, anything but how we control how we respond. And we never really were in control. We thought we were. I know. Right? And I think this virus is showing us that, you know what, we really aren't in control. And that is a violation of our own safety, as you, as you said. And you're right, never, at least in my lifetime, has our safety been put in so, such a vulnerable position. And I think it scares us and makes us uneasy. So your point of just being in the moment and, and let, kind of letting it go after that is, is really, really important. Um, I think that's, for me, uh, just understanding that is, is worth a lot getting through this crisis. Um, the, the, second, the second word is kindness. And you know, love is patient, love is kind. And so many people misunderstand this, David. I, you know, we, we all interpret this as being nice all the time. We can't be nice all the time. As leaders, if you're a parent or a leader of a major corporation, we have to hold people accountable. But I think in this time, it's much more important than ever to not only have compassion, but to show your kindness and to show your appreciation, your enthusiasm, which means, you know, we're already exhausted. We're all exhausted. For some reason, it's more tiring to have a Zoom call uh, 12 hours a day than it is to <laughs> to be with people, right? But I know this sounds simple, but just starting the day before we jump on our phone, before we jump on that Zoom call, we spend 15, 20 minutes reflecting on yesterday and think about who can I thank? Who can I show appreciation to? And write a note, a handwritten note at best. I mean, look, we all get too many emails and texts. I would recommend even a handwritten note, which is like an ancient art, hardly practiced anymore. But Jack Hershen, who ran the company I worked for for so many years and led for so many years, he did that every day. And you think about the cumulative effect of just writing three letters a day, seven days a week, you know, 20 a week times 50 a year. You've got hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands letters over time. And his handwritten notes are like gold in that company. And this is when we have to step up and be more kind, more encouraging, even even when we don't feel like it, um, you know, applying it to my son, he's, he's scared. He's 19. He's getting out. He's going to go to college and to try to sh give them confidence is part of kindness. And I think a really, a really important point. So do you have any, any thoughts on that from, from your standpoint? Yeah, I do. The, one of the interesting things that we're seeing, like we're, we're seeing some real extremes, right? So we're seeing people being kind, very kind, like, really wanting to help be part of the solution. But we're also seeing people that are completely gripped by fear and they're projecting that fear onto other people. Um, not really for any reason, but I have this theory that when people blame, it's a way for them to take back control over something that they feel victimized by and they feel out of control by. So if I can blame you, yes. um, I can identify the evil that is entered my life and it gives me an idea of what to do to isolate that or, or attack it or run from it or, you know, whatever. Um, but in this case, 
it's really interesting because it's like it's not anybody's fault really uh, what happened it, the whole world is is being impacted by mm -hmm. this but and this unique thing where we all have to be basically alone at home or, or with our families and I see I see families taking it out on each other like we get a lot of calls from people that we support if, where husbands and wives and partners are they're they're fighting uh, and blaming each other for all all kinds of stuff. So, you know, I think it is so important what you said about kindness because if, again, if we could keep that forefront in our mind as a practice, then we can bring that to the situation and not bring the fear to the situation or the aggression to the situation or the projection to the situation. So that's how I kind of see it. That is so well said. I'm I'm glad you brought up the the spouse issue because. We've all seen it. There's a lot of jokes on the on the internet about how spouses are fighting like cats and dogs. Yeah, I mean it's a it, they're they're done in a funny way, but it's not a funny situation. No. And um, that yeah, we have to start with our family. If we lose our family just because of this kind of fighting or or lose good relationships, that's a really sad thing. So I appreciate that. That's a that's a good one to keep. On uh, the third word, David is trusting, and you know. Uh, I've found, and you're an entrepreneur, a very successful one. I, I'm very entrepreneurial, even though I've, I've been in some big companies, but also some very small ones like the Amazon startup. Most entrepreneurs I have found, like myself, it's hard for us to trust other people's judgment, and we, we tend to want to control too much. And at least I'm speaking for myself. I think in these environments, things have to move so fast. Uh, for instance, I'm chairman of Orange right now, which is a we serve churches all over the world uh, with curriculum products. And obviously their whole world's changed to at-home service. And we've been pivoting so hard and so fast. We have to give up authority, delegate more, take more chances, take more risk. The tendency for leaders is to grab control when things get in a crisis mode. And I learned this the hard way when I was, uh, I was running a, an Amazon company. We actually sold cars through Amazon back in back in the day in 1999, 2000. Well, when the market crashed then, we literally, we thought going in as CEO, I thought I had three years of cash to get it public and get it established. Amazon selling cars. Well, because of circumstances too long to discuss, after the crash, we only had uh, 47 days of cash left at the current burn rate versus wow. three years. Things got pulled, funding got pulled. So what I learned in that, is I had to just delegate like crazy. I had to make some really tough decisions really fast and every hour literally mattered. Um, and before that I had been with Saab and I didn't move as quickly. And I really learned it at, at that Amazon experience. We need to trust, we need to let go and we need to give a lot of information. And one thing I wanna say about being uh, trusting in this case the more we define who's doing what, I know this sounds simple, but most leaders just kind of ready, fire, aim. I've really learned through others that laying out the process so we know who to copy, we know who to CC, we know who to keep up to speed on, what I call the RASI chart in the book, is a way that you show others you trust them because they own it, they have to get it done by this deadline. And in this crisis, I think we have to do that even more than ever, especially as we're disparate, all spread all over the place. So does that make sense to you? Yeah, it absolutely does. And, you know, uh, one of the things that I've observed with trust is that it kind of starts with us. If people, if people aren't their word with themselves, they break trust with themselves and then they kind of reinforce this doubt about what they can do and what they can't do in their life. And I often ask people, reestablish trust with yourself first by being your word. Pick, take things, certain things in your life and commit to doing them no matter what. And then add to them as you go so that you reestablish that trust with yourself. Because as you reestablish it, you'll see that you evaluate things different. You'll see that you, you schedule and arrange things different. You'll know how to hold other people accountable because of your own experience and what it took to trust yourself. So you know you you, you don't accept you don't trust just blindly, but you trust through, um, you know, really evaluating what another person is saying, what they're doing, uh, and hold and and the ability to hold yourself accountable and other people also. Boy, that is. Um... 
for your listeners, that's a, that's a huge gem. That, that leads directly into the next word, which is truthfulness. It's trustworthy, then truthful. And as you're saying that, when you were saying about we have to start, although you said trusting, it also applies. We have to start with being truthful to ourselves. Okay. And I, and I got chills on my spine because my, the biggest failure, I, you know, the, the bios talk about all the successes, but I had a complete meltdown in my life. Um, I, I, I basically resigned from being CEO of Saab and I lost my marriage within six months of each other. And it was a long-term marriage, four children. It was, it was horrific. And the, what it was caused by me not even being truthful with myself, how unhealthy I was, my self-destructive behavior. Um, and if I had listened to your words and said, I, I have to do what I say first before I can help anybody else. Yeah. But somehow we lie to ourselves. We, we blame others. We, we find a way to justify our unhealthiness. And in a crisis, it even multiplies on itself. So your point of we have to start with being trustworthy, being truthful, then we can demand it on others. And you know, I can't change what happened. I can only change going forward and always, always, always be a truthful person going forward. But um, you know, if I can implore that on your listeners, if I can stop one person from going through or one couple going through what we went through um, and to be truthful, I would, it would be worth this, this half hour together. I will also tell you that um, it scares me right now with the marriages and the relationships that are happening on this yeah. crisis. I think there are going to be a lot of struggles out there. So is there a, is there a, a truth that you would recommend people start with in a crisis like this? Like if you were talking to somebody, is it, is it based on their individual situation or is, is there something that you could recommend that they look for some kind of a general truth to maybe build a foundation off of? Well, for me personally, um, it, it starts with your values. It starts with your value set. And like it or not, everybody has a value set. It, it may be very different than what you and I believe. You know, mine happens to come from my faith and I, I didn't always stay to that. And that's, that's where mine came from. Everybody has to find their own path there. But to me, being truthful means being true to the value set you hold for yourself. It's, it's integrity to that value set. And I, and I can, I implore people because when you fail on that, other people may not know, but it's still damaging you. It's still making you unhealthy. It's still making you um, in a situation to be self-destructive. I would implore people just be true to your own value set and then the rest will take care of itself because digging out of the valley that you go in when you, realize the truth about the mistakes you made and who you were, uh, that valley is not a valley I would want anyone else to go through. Um, and so I, the, the simple answer is stick to whatever value set. Hopefully it's a good one built, you know, I believe from kind of Judeo, uh, the, you know, Judeo Christian kind of ethics and, and uh, belief system, I think is a good one, but everyone has to find their own path there. Got it. All right. What's number five? So number five is forgiving and kind of related to this theme we have about uh, forgiving or you know, being truth for ourselves or being uh, trustworthy ourselves. It is to forgive. And it's, it's forgiving ourselves first because, um, you know, none of us really signed up for, I mean, you are probably ahead of the curve, but most leaders didn't sign up to be technology experts and have to deliver everything at home and be experts on Zoom and like uh, you already have been. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think we have to be somewhat forgiving ourselves, but, but more importantly, I think is forgiving others. And again, as leaders, so much of our language is about accountability and firing people if they're not successful or letting them go. That, that has to happen sometimes and it will have to happen through this. But as far as day in and day out, I do think compassion to our employees is key uh, and making sure if they make mistakes, we put them right back on the horse, right back into battle the next day, because the time will come that we, we, have, to, uh, we have to restructure, we have to move things around, which um, as I'm talking about this, I'll just, I will insert one thing that I would say, when I, went, when I was talking about patience, 
the one thing in a crisis we can't be patient with is adjusting to the situation. I mean, for a small business, it means holding on to cash for dear life. I mean, any non-essential expense is not going to happen. Yeah. Um, I would also say share the blame with many people. Don't don't take it all. Um, you know, at, at the lower levels of the organizations, everybody should share the pain. So. Uh, but that's basically a forgiving is forgiving others and forgiving ourselves uh, for maybe our normal standard level through this crisis. I, I just think we're all going through a lot and we have to be willing to forgive ourselves. Yeah. I Any agree. On that? Well, my kind of my take on this is also this kind of like an intellectual understanding that none of us have any experience with dealing with something like this. No. Like nobody on the planet really has any experience dealing with this very unique situation. So we all, it, it, we have to understand that we have to help each other and we have to learn from each other. And we have to, we have to put our differences down. We have to put our ego down in order to come together to be able to do that, which I think does require forgiving things that, that we've been holding against ourselves or against other people. So we can be open to information that is going to benefit us during this time. So that's kind of how I see, you know, like just from an intellectual, how do I understand how to do that? What is the purpose and benefit for me to do that? That's, that's kind of my thought. Yep, that, that makes absolute total sense, um, which gets back to truthful. If you're not truthful, if you don't have the air cleared, it's really hard to be forgiving. Once you talk it out and get it all out and be truthful about whatever happened, then you can move to forgiveness, but, but really not before. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time. The, the, next, the next to last word, the sixth word is unselfishness, which um, I've already touched on a little bit, but I think my main point there in a crisis, I think we should always be unselfish. And I think the top leaders should always be very generous. And at Hirsch and we had minimum wages and living wages way before they become, they had become kind of popular in culture because we were privately held. But I think in this case, we just we need to spread the pain as much as possible. And that just means that there have to be pay cuts. Everybody takes them. The senior leaders take them more than anybody else. Um, hopefully people have cash reserves so they can continue to pay people. I actually think the government, um, like their approach or not, they've done a good job as a whole getting money to the American people yeah. quickly so we don't have to lay people off. I, it's nice to see, you know, the two parties working together, get that done. I actually think they've been unselfish in this situation. Um, but I don't any, any, uh, any thoughts on that one? And I just have one more. I think, I think one of the ways is, that, that I'm recommending to people is that they don't just think about themselves and their, and their own fear and their own worries. I think Part of the door that lets us out of this crisis, that finds our way out of this crisis, is through helping our brothers and sisters, looking yeah. for opportunity to be a benefit. And I think everybody has something that they can help somebody else with. And I mean, if a person, I mean, obviously, if you're stuck in fear, if you're, if you're worrying, if you're doubting, if you're afraid, you're only going to be like closing the world in around yourself. But if you practice the stuff that you talked about here, it kind of opens you up to be able to see how can I benefit somebody else? Like I can do something, even if I have to call somebody and just ask them how their day is going or talk to them, I can do something to benefit the life of another person. And I think that's a very unselfish, you know, thing to do. And I think it's very important right now. Oh man, David, I think it's so critical. You know, my, my father, I tell this story in my book, I grew up very, very poor and uh, my dad, uh, kind of worked multiple jobs. He had a, he had an Oliver 55 tractor and that's about his only big possession. But anytime it snowed, he would go to our neighbors and plow their driveways for free. Anytime, it, you know, their grass was too long, he would just go cut it. That's about all he had, but he was very unselfish with it. And your point of maybe, maybe we don't have money, but we can call, we can be encouraging. We can yeah. write a note. We can be, you know, whatever, whatever we can do, that's being unselfish. And uh, I really love your point there. I, the, the last word of the seven words of love in love works is dedicated. And in the normal world, and this is, this is a whole nother conversation for a different time. And if people are interested, it's, a lot of it's in the book. So many people talk about values, 
they, they, most companies have them, but very few put processes around them and, and into, integrate them into the culture. So at Hershen, as an example, we rated people on those seven words of love. They, they bas we basically had behaviors they had to, to match. Those are called the B goals. What kind of leader do I want to be? Everybody has do goals. What am I going to do today to grow profit or grow customers or grow margin? But we measured both the B and the do, and we actually rewarded people more if they achieve both scores highly if they were both low they probably wouldn't make it very long that's in the in the context of love works as a as a fundamental driver of culture there's a lot to that point that we don't have time for it's not words it's led by the leaders it's process driven and it gets results like i've never seen in this case i think it means more just when we're put in charge or we are in charge whether we're a dad a mom a business leader, we have to take charge. And this is where people really look for strong leaders. And you see it all over the place where people are stepping up. And sometimes they're not the appointed leader, but they're stepping up. And that's what I would encourage people, regardless of if you're fearful, if you're scared, if you have grief, um, you're not sure what to do. If you if you put in charge, take charge, we're all going to make mistakes. You know, people right now, sometimes I've found myself, I, I, if I've ever frozen up in a crisis, it's because I want to give people absolute clarity um, and certainty. Certainty is a better word. I want to give them the certainty about the future. Well, one thing I learned when I was at SeaWorld and we were under the PETA attacks and Blackfish and our, our profit and cash flow dropped in a half in a, a year and a half. We were under massive attacks, protests <laughs> every day. I, I learned that in the end of the day, you know, I can only control what I can control. I have to take charge. I couldn't provide certainty, but I could provide clarity to the employees. Clarity of what we're doing about the situation, what we don't know, what we do know, where we're not sure, but they absolutely knew why we were going in the direction we did. And even if they didn't agree with it, they were appreciative that I provided clarity even though um, I couldn't always provide certainty of what right. would happen with SeaWorld. I think that's the same thing here. Truth is, we don't know for sure. Um, but hopefully that helps, helps some of your listeners take charge when you're put in charge. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. I know that it was that one thing that you talked about there, um, you know, being dedicated and, and who you're being, that's the thing that changed my life years ago when I was angry and lost and didn't know which way to turn and it th things were just getting worse and worse and worse in my life. I changed three things about my being, three things in my own attitude about how I was showing up every day. And it was a weird thing because nobody ever taught me that. It was something that popped into my mind and I was like, okay, well, let's just try this, <laughs> see hmm. if this works, right? And my life changed instantly in 30 days. It, it just kept getting better and better. And then I was like, okay, I have to learn about what I did because I don't understand this, but it's working for some reason. So I- What were those three things or is that too long of an answer? No, I can tell you really quick. It was act like I love what I'm doing because I was showing up every day being like, I freaking hate this job. I hate everybody. I hate you. You know, I was, I was so angry. I hated everything. The second one was treat everybody with total respect. Yep. And the third one was do every job to the best of my ability. So I changed those three things and my income went from 20,000 a year to 62,000 a year uh, back around 1992. Hmm. Um, I, had, I, I didn't even finish high school. I was, I was driving a forklift and I couldn't get, I was, I, I was also married, had two children and we went bankrupt. We had our car repossessed. I mean, it was just getting worse and worse. And you had a so, terrible accident too. I, I, I did have a terrible accident. Yeah, which, which kind of preceded the, uh, this, this uh, attitude change but I was looking for a way to change my situation. Of course, this is pre-internet. I needed money to go back to college. I didn't have it. I needed time to go back to college. I didn't have that either. So I had to find another way. And I had a real emotional meltdown in the back of a trailer one night. I was just crying. And I said, God, show me something, anything on how to, you know, like, tell me what to do. I will do it. And a voice in my head said, change your attitude. That's all it said. I never heard it again. That was it. So I thought, okay, what is an attitude? And I took a guy, and he was the guy that owned the company that I worked for. And I said, what's the difference like fundamentally between him and me? What do I notice? And those were the three things that I noticed. He loved what he did. He treated everybody with respect. 
And he must, I figured out he must have done every job to the best of his ability because he started this huge food import company in his garage in, in like Melrose Park, Illinois or something like that. And now it was a major corporation. Like they, most of the imported foods that we have in this country are because of him. Wow. So um, that's, 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 where, that's where it started. That's a great story. And I, I think a lot of these principles, the seven words we've talked about in Love Works, they, they match up with that so well. Um, you know, being unselfish means you serve people and do your best regardless, even if it's not to your own benefit. And, you know, people often ask me, David, I say the same thing you did. I get probably the most common question was, wow, you've been CEO for 25 years. You know, how did you get there? How did you, how did it happen? I said, you know, I, I never sought it out. I just, I, I grew up poor, I was hungry, and I worked harder than everybody. I over-delivered on what people asked me to do, and I was really respectful of people. And the jobs came to me, and I never sought them out. And it's really, it's the same three things you're saying, three people respect, work really hard. And I, you know, I, I loved everything I did in my head, but a lot of jobs I wanted to get out of, but you still learn from them, right? Even if yeah. they're bad. Jobs, 100%. They still point you towards where uh, the creator uh, wants us to be and wants us to serve. So um, that's a very good point. I appreciate you sharing that. But uh, I know I've gone over your time a little bit, but I, I just really, uh, if anybody has any interest, uh, you know, I'm going to start a website up and uh, I'm going to make it available for people to have counseling or just talk about their issues at work. And, uh, but love works is where it starts and I hope people enjoy it. Awesome. Yeah. So hey, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, Joel Manby and the book is love works. And he went through the seven principles today of, you know, really how we should be showing up in life. And, and, and honestly, I think what we described today will help a lot of people. Like it'll give them something to actually really do in practice that will also help change their perception of what's going on and see opportunities in front of them. So I, I can't thank you enough and, you know, God be with you in your journey. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Good for thank you. you, David. And um, if I'm, if they want to get, uh, I'm going to write a PDF on a fuller um, layout of all that we've talked about. That's just for crisis. And if they're interested in that, It'll be uh, loveworksbyjoelmanby.com and they could just Google that and it'll Great. be a few weeks before it's available, but they can certainly download it for free because I just want to try to help people in this very difficult situation. I hear you. We'll make sure we put that in the show notes too. Thank right. you so much, Joel. Great. Thank you, David. I appreciate it very much. You're welcome. Talk to you yeah. soon. Bye. Bye. Hey, if you like this video, be sure to share it on social and leave a comment below and don't forget to subscribe.